Um, good morning, everyone. Uh, in this presentation, I address the historic tradition of dual research approach in psychology from the perspective of seeking uh, accumulative psychological science. I hope to accomplish this in five stages. First, I briefly define and provide a historical background and then describe the dual research methods tradition in psychology, followed by a presentation of three sets of historical data that establish psychology's grand experiment. And then I'll provide a comparative outcome of the grand experiment that necessitates the need for greater focus on the cumulative character of psychological science. And finally, I hope to provide an alternative approach that requires an overhaul of our current practices. First, let's begin with the now standard definition of psychology as the scientific study of behavior and mental processes. This is the typical definition you get in introductory psychology textbooks. Historians of psychology pin its founding to the establishment of the first psychological laboratory in Leipzig, Germany in 1879 by Wundt. Since its founding, Psychology has developed into a discipline of very diverse perspectives and approaches. The scientific method, according to textbook, introductory textbooks in psychology, is the glue that holds the whole discipline together as one. Its history has revealed psych psychology to have evolved two parallel methodologies. In current parlance, the large N group design and the small N individual design. Contemporary psychology would appear to use only large N group design, but in reality, the two have coexisted for decades, albeit largely in parallel. Despite the current apparent predominance of large N designs, Psychological research began with small numbers of subjects, as we will see shortly. Those small end designs were prevalent in psychological research before large end designs evolved with statistical methods and remained alongside them. A major purpose of the presentation here is to show that the two methods, first one alone, and then the two together invariably established psychology's grand experiment. The impetus for the grand experiment is that it affords a methodological assessment of the relative efficacy of the two methods in psychology in supporting the cumulative character of the sciences. Despite important differences in the focus on behavior versus mind, today's uh, mental processes, most experiments in psychology studied small number of subjects for decades, as I just indicated. There are several lines of evidence for the prevalence of the use of small numbers of subjects in psychological research in the early years. First, for reasons that will become clearer later, for expediency, I examined exper uh, uh, experimental psychology articles appearing in American Journal of Psychology from 1900, well after the founding of the founding years of psychology, to 1950, for evidence for the type of research that was prevalent in those early years of psychological research. So here are some data. These data represent the number of subjects in each article from various publication years. And they show that one, most articles reported very few number of subjects 
throughout the period. And two, only in later years do we see large numbers from about 50 to 100 subjects, specifically only seven, of, seven articles, about 12%. This set of data, set of articles, reported more than one experiment showing that one, some of them used small numbers in all their experiments, about 12% of them. And some of them used both small n in one experiment and large n in another experiment, as we see in 1925, 1928, and the 1937 articles. And finally, we see that only six articles, 10.5%, reported using more than 100 subjects. In the study uh, of memory processes, I extensively discussed the work of Guilford and Dellenberg and Oberle, which were the two in the, in the previous slide Martin Green, if you go back to the slides, you'll see that. Both of them studied a few number of subjects in what they described as intensive studies, and large number, about 100 subjects, in what they called extensive studies. What is notable about them is that they did not use inferential statistics to analyze their data, despite using large numbers. How then did inferential statistics creep into psychological research? Hubbard and Ryan's survey of other psychology journals provide a window into what happened. They provide an empirical window into what happened historically in psychology, revealing the inception of the adoption of statistical methods generally and the growth of inferential null hypothesis statistical testing in particular. So what is NHST? To appreciate the import of the entry of inferential statistics into psychological research, let's consider very briefly the historical background of their use in psychology. In the 1930s and early 1940s, according to Schneider in a 2015 paper, textbooks in statistics and research design combined two different and controversial approaches to statistical inference. Despite very important differences between the two approaches into the hybrid we recognize today as null hypothesis statistical system. So the two approaches were Fisherian significance testing and Heyman Pearson hypothesis test testing. Those textbooks combine them into null hypothesis testing that is prevalent today. Contemporary psychological research heavily relies on NHST for data analysis and interpretation and is therefore an important focal point to the purpose of the present analysis. Back to Hubbard and Ryan, they examined 12 APA American Psychological Association journals listed here, ranging from clinical, educational, experimental to the last three general review journals. In the significant testing timeline their data show, the 1930s marked the appearance and the explosion of NHST reporting in psychological research. The results showed that of the three inferential statistics available at the time, including uh, pro probable errors and critical ratios and p-values, in the 1910s, only probable error and critical ratios were reported for inference. But following the hybridization that I mentioned in the previous slide, in the 1930s, we see the gradual rise in p-value reporting. They caught up with critical ratio and probable errors, and 
probable errors practically di disappeared by the later periods. And of course, presently, what we have is predominance of NHST in psychological research. So what was happening during the early period when there was no influential statistics at all? Well, according to Hubbard and Ryan, prior to 1940, experimentation with the individual subject or participant for the most part formed the basis for inductive claims in psychological research. There are many problems with the use of p-values in NHST, of course, including the gross misconception that it reflects repl replicability of the results, which is probably one of the reasons we have complications with its use in psychological research today. Finally, the last line of evidence comes from Duke's N equal one paper, in which he presented the case for the coexistence of the two traditions in psychological research in the context of the apparent dominance of the large N approach in mainstream psychology. Duke provided selective historical review of N equal one studies ranging from Ebbinghaus 1885 study of memory all the way to Kellogg's 1933 CHIMP project with Gua, the CHIMP. Later, minor examples also included the Yaki's work in 1927, Jacobson's 1931, Potts 1932, and Kohler and Mottler's in 1934. Subsequently, in 1934 to 1963, N equal one studies appeared in various journals, ranging from the American Journal of Psychology, which I presented data from previously, to Journal of Psychology. Now, I'll point out that notice that the, the absence of the Journal of the Experimental Analysis of Behavior from this list, suggesting that N equal one research was not a phenomenon limited to behavioral psychology. The period also covered the publication of Skinner's The Behavior of Organisms and Sidman's Tactics of Scientific Research, both being important publications in behavioral psychology, one of them empirical, the other methodological textbook. Uh, I'm going to skip a lot of slides to get to the results so that in the interest of time, I'll be able to get to my alternative proposal. Um, the results showed that there are adverse consequences of widespread NHST adoption in psychological research, including p-hacking and publication bias, rampant failures of replication, lack of representativeness and generalizability, and of course, lack of accumulative science. Now, if we compare small n and large n designs, as it's been, as both are used currently in contemporary uh, research, we see that p is, is prevalent in large end designs and is utterly irrelevant in small end designs. There are rampant failures to replicate in group designs. Replication, of course, is built in into small end designs. Lack of representativeness and generalizability, of course, in group designs, replications in small end designs ensures generality of the results. Lack of cumulative science is a phenomenon we witness in psychology relying on group designs, which is a mute issue, issue with small end designs. So the methodological imperatives for the way forward towards a cumulative psychological science is based on the notion that repeatability reproducibility and replication are essential for the self-correcting character of scientific knowledge. As the theory of evolution abundantly illustrates, striving for accumulative psychological science is a worthwhile endeavor. 
uh, a couple of observations from the haystack of current solutions being uh, provided about that I think are important in forming a new alternative approach is the notion that the history of large end and small end studies side by side before the introduction of inferential st statistics suggests that the two different approaches provide different purposes for researchers. In current situation, even with inferential statistics, what kind of role could they play? Well, according to Sox and is, uh, Smith and Little and Norman, we can distinguish large N being purposely situated for estimating population parameters and small N where, for situations where we require repeated measures of the individual. The apparent neglect of Bayesian uh, inferential statistics for NHST, which I've discussed in, in another paper, indicates a misconception of the respective role the two of them play, Bayesian statistics and NHST as a form of inference. So the way forward is a need for an overhaul of current parallel of the current parallel traditions for a more dynamic process-oriented methodology. Here is the alternative that I offer for uh, dealing with the problem of lack of cumulative science. I don't have time to go through all of these, so I'll go very quickly to the implications of the broader adoption uh, and the paper is going to elaborate more on this, of course. Uh, this overhaul will require a significant shift in how we approach asking research questions. No longer pre-experimental statistical con considerations will be required. How we design experiments is not either group or individual by default. Collecting data, uh, no snapshot average measures. We can use extensive in-depth study instead using small end designs. Uh, analyzing and interpreting data is no longer, uh, we have to pay closer attention to the reality of the situation as revealed by functional uh, relationships between environmental factors and observed behavior and mental processes. Research method and statistics textbooks must focus on both NHST and Bayesian inference, not just NHST as is the common practice now. They need to teach both group and individual research designs, among others, and the focus on research purpose first and foremost, in addition to statistical requirements. In conclusion, to realize a cumulative psychological science, the new approach requires a focus on process-focused research and less on hypothetical constructs, which is common in psychology today. This overall alternative provides a synergy of eclectic approaches informed by processes, not statistics. In the overall methodological approach, we see that research questions not inferential statistical considerations dictate research design. Any research question may be addressed using either or both large N and small N designs, even without inferential statistics. Interest in population parameters dictates use of group designs, not default adoption of group design. Research interest in exploratory questions or theoretical testing dictates use of NHST or Bayesian statistics, respectively. The latter can no longer be ignored by default. And finally, reporting practices would have to accommodate differences in research questions, interests, and goals. Thank you for your attention.